I haven't done this for two years. Uh, can you all hear me at the back? Uh, okay, and thank you so much for coming in person. Uh, I know it's always complicated, but it means a lot for someone who's trying to share uh, science. And I'm going to try to do something uh, informal today. Uh, and I wanted to share sort of how we think about the class of problems we work on. And we'll try to touch many ideas and topics. Uh, I'm here afterward. Uh, we can talk quite a lot about uh, some of them. Uh, and before I begin, I want to start with uh, this meeting is being recorded. So we are all okay with that. Uh, how do I get rid of that? Uh, okay. Uh, it's the people I get a chance to work with. I think uh, all of you know this, uh, spending time in the lab. Um, it's a privilege. We all explore science in many different ways, uh, uh, but science is about people. And uh, one of the things that I've deeply enjoyed, and especially having uh, put in two completely different disciplines, uh, is uh, how we've been able to interweave and learn from very fundamental uh, science and physics to make solutions that we might not be thinking about that might be valuable. And sometimes just being out there in the middle of nowhere to find interesting problems that probably nobody cares about. And today's topic is the problems that nobody cares about. But I'm going to explain and share why uh, there is, or there might be a connection between recreational biology, which I'll call this, uh, and the history, uh, which many of you know in recreational mathematics. Uh, so just a show of hands, how many of you know Martin Gardner? Uh, I am really surprised. Uh, if some of you have not, uh, just look this person up. Uh, probably one of the most uh, prolific writer in recreational mathematics. Uh, when I started, uh, you know, kind of thinking about mathematics and finding his puzzles and uh, the objects uh, of very deep curiosity, phenomenal questions, but shared in a manner that a child can understand. Uh, it it's at least personally makes me think quite a lot about proposing ideas in context of puzzles. So I'm going to try to do that today to share with you lots of paradoxes and puzzles that might act as the primary reason we're exploring an idea. I may or may not be able to answer many of them, but at least we will go through some of them. Uh, of course, as an individual, uh, uh, if you read the history of 25 years of this one person's work, he has been single-handedly responsible for some of the most popular mathematics articles that have ever been written in the history of uh, mathematics as we know it now. Uh, and two of them that you might be very well aware of, uh, this was uh, Conway's Game of Life, uh, he introduced Conway to the world in some sense, and that led to an entire tradition of people exploring these ideas. Uh, of course, the Penrose tiling uh, that led to many people exploring quasi-crystals, primarily because these ideas were hidden uh, in deep mathematics. Uh, and the connection I want to make here today is the simplicity of how we communicate our ideas might be valuable to take in other fields. Uh, and again, uh, I think there is a tradition in physics to be thinking about these of what we call toy problems. But in biology, uh, often enough, at least the way we communicate, uh, we miss out on these toy problems. Uh, uh, and one of the things that we'll try to do today is the questions that we cover and think about should at least be simple to explain, uh, and their answers may or may not be well known. Okay, so with this context in mind, I want to introduce you to this notion of recreational biology. How do we get rid of all of these little icons here? Uh, does anybody know? If I have a mouse, okay, there we go, X, more, hide, yeah, hide, loading controls, and then dim the lights. Yeah, uh, it's gonna get incredibly dark here. Okay, uh, this is my favorite children's book. I always start with this book because if you can find it, it's a rare book it's called The Golden Book of Biology, illustrated by an incredible artist, uh, uh, Charlie Harper. Uh, 
And one of the things that I love about this book is every line is poetry, but it's trying to state uh, challenges in biology in very simple language. And of course, uh, one of the images, my favorite image of all times in this book is the image on the left. Uh, Harper is trying to explain and share the diversity of biology on this planet. But what I love is that the lion and the Euglena are equal in size. And one of the things that we don't understand often thinking about diversity of life is it's important. And sometimes we associate what you can see with its importance and hence the pandemic. Uh, but it's valuable to think about what we are losing at this time and how many little puzzles are being lost every day. If you look at uh, any accounts of you know, the sixth grade extinction, uh, and one of the things that I would like us to think about is hidden in any one of these sets of animals are ideas and puzzles that could possibly unravel uh, new ideas in biology. Uh, so the goal would be is we will talk about these sets of puzzles, but we will also really explore our environments to be able to ask these questions. Okay, so let's start with uh, history in, in the context of topology. You all are very well exposed to these sets of ideas and how important a role topology has played in discovering new ideas in material science, uh, in mathematics. But uh, how do you really think about topology in the context of biology? So I'm going to introduce the cartoon Taurus. Uh, I love this paper just for that bull. Uh, you all know that uh, from an animal body plan perspective, uh, you can be thought of a, a Taurus. And, but if you look very carefully at the tree of life, you'll realize that much of how we organize the tree of life is actually based on topological principles uh, in uh, the animal world, in the metazoans. Uh, if you think about uh, you know, organization of DNA, you can think about uh, many developmental body plants associated with organoids. Uh, topology plays a really interesting role. And very recently, we have started to understand that the role of understanding active matter might be in the language of topology. If we want to control uh, active matter, we might really have to think about topology, all the way from how a tissue in a hydra buds itself, how epithelial cells uh, essentially have very classical defects that we have thought about. So we will explore this idea a little bit more to ask a very simple question. I bought a donut with me. This will be the only recreational part of this talk. Uh, here is a question I've been thinking about for the last 10 years. Uh, I don't know the answer so well, but do toroidal cells exist? Uh, you know, as a physicist, that's the next genus you can think about. We know spherical cells exist. Uh, could they exist? So first of all, everybody knows here Purcell uh, and what he wrote about these imaginative animals and how they move. It actually turns out one of the mechanisms that uh, Purcell talked about in his very famous lecture now, Life at Low Reynolds Number, was really a toroidal swimmer. Uh, it's a very elegant argument about thinking about uh, irreversibility in swimming kinetics. Uh, we know toroids can exist as vesicles. There is nothing fundamental about this. You can really write down the energetics uh, people have seen, although it was quite surprising that only in 1990s were we able to first see uh, toroidal vesicles. Uh, and one of the reasons this is challenging to think about is if a cell was a toroid, how do you think it would divide? Or is there a complication associated with cell division? So you all know the fundamental principle of cell biology is that a cell has to divide. Uh, there is a very famous Martin Gardner puzzle, which I'll leave uh, the answer to, is with three planes, how many uh, pieces can you cut a toroid in? And the, uh, I don't know how many of you have already done this. Uh, it's quite, a, quite an interesting answer. Uh, but the reason I want to introduce this notion of a toroid is to introduce this man, Ray Rappert. Uh, he is uh, really a pioneer in the study of cytokinesis of how cells divide. Uh, if you notice where he worked for 40, 50 years of his life, he worked in a lab that was just right there off the coast of Maine, all alone. Uh, primarily just thinking about ideas. But he did very classical, very clean experiments to really unravel beautiful puzzles in cytokinesis. And one of his puzzles was a toroidal cell. Of course, he couldn't find one, so he created one. Uh, and this is a sand dollar. Uh, and the way you create a toroidal cell, this has now been replicated also in C. elegans. 
you just take a little glass needle and you stick it in a cell that would topologically form a toroid. And what he was shocked and surprised to find is, of course, so I have a donut. You can see the first cell division. The first cell division happens. The spindle, you form a cytokinetic ring and you would get topologically a U-shaped object. That's right here. Now, the second cell division begins and you have created essentially three cells. And he remarks in his paper, uh, of course, no sense of mechanism, uh, but just really what he saw, uh, which is a new furrow appeared between the asterisk and the binucleate cell at a completely normal time, creating four cells at exactly the same time a normal cell would have actually undergone a traditional cell division. So to the left are those little four cells up on top, and to the right is this toroidal cell that was artificially created. This very simple conceptual experiment actually led to the idea that astral microtubules are the ones that signal and create uh, the cytokinetic ring. Now, I, I just love this example just for its simplicity. Uh, he asked a conceptual question and he really got a conceptual answer. The question was very simple to ask, uh, but I'm still not satisfied because I really want to see a toroidal cell. I mean, if this is possible, why, why would it not exist in nature? Uh, or have we not looked hard enough? Uh, almost five years ago, I was giving a talk at Caltech just like this. I had an opening in my schedule. And lo and behold, with my little old scope, and the Caltech turtle pond, which many of you might have known, I thought I found a toroidal cell, right there it is. Uh, it's up on the top right. Uh, it looks everything just like a donut, except a tiny little cell. Um, I played around with it. I brought it to the lab. I couldn't grow it. Uh, and unfortunately, when I dug in a little bit, uh, it turns out, although it looked toroidal, topologically it was not. Uh, this is a diffusia. It's an amoeba. Uh, it forms a shell that looks toroidal, but inside the cytoplasm is actually still a ball. So this was a false start, uh, which can happen sometimes if you're really thinking about uh, looking for strange things out at nature. But I haven't given up, and I would not be here telling you the story if I didn't have the answer for you. But we're going to wait for the next few minutes before we jump back to searching for a toroidal cell. I'm going to now take you next to the only serious part of this talk, which is where I've been looking for uh, new cells and new behaviors, which is in the middle of the ocean. Uh, and we'll come back and find uh, what we discovered uh, along the way. Uh, one of the contexts of this is uh, the idea of to be able to do cell biology in the context of the environment. Often enough, when we ask questions, we strip the environment and you end up uh, asking a question that might have missed the main point. And one of the main points we're interested in is just really understanding if you could, for example, in that painting to the right, cut a chasm into the ocean and see it vertically, what, and you were just a single floating cell, there are billions and billions of cells in our oceans, what would it feel like? What would you experience? And any of you who know, go diving or snorkeling, you know the answer. First of all, you'll feel a lot of pressure. Every 10 meters is one atmosphere. So we're talking about if you're at a thousand meters, that's hundred atmospheres of pressure on single cells and multicellular systems. We have absolutely no idea from a biological context, how can life survive that? But early expeditions from the longest time have shown that we have an incredibly biodiverse richness all across the vertical column. The other sets of things that you would see is that there is an incredible amount of dynamics associated with life in the ocean. Uh, this is a simulation from uh, McFollow's group at MIT. And one of the things that I find remarkable is just the dynamics associated with life in the ocean. Uh, every one of these little blips, this is a simulation based on satellite data, is life in the trillions, abundant, uh, dynamically engaged in the environment, which is associated with the structure of the ocean, uh, the flows. Uh, but most importantly, what we'll try to focus today is the context of depth. And one thing, if you were to just go to that one spot where you see that little blip and dive in, uh, this is what you would actually see. Uh, this is the density, the native density 
of living organisms in that tiny little spot of uh, bloom that you just saw. And one of the puzzling things to think really about is how do we really understand this? How do you map these types of ecosystems? Hundreds of millions of genes that have been mapped for the last 20, 30 years of genomics, 50% or more have absolutely no known functions because we just don't really map to the ecology of this type of an environment. Uh, and the only reason I said that this is the only serious part of the talk is uh, related to climate change. Uh, so if you really were to think about 40 billion metric ton of total CO2 generated, there are lots of estimates but around 20 billion metric ton is absorbed by what is called the biological pump. We will talk quite a lot about that uh, in a second, but essentially it is life in the ocean that absorbs the CO2, converts that carbon into organic matter that sinks to the bottom of the ocean. And that's how we capture. This is the existing carbon sequestration technology at planetary scale that actually works. How it works and why it works, we don't know, but it works. And one of the sets of estimates are if somebody was to switch off the biological pump today, our CO2 in the atmosphere would jump from 400 to 600 parts per million. So we, ha we have no idea what the limits of this pump are. We have no idea how these ecosystems are structured. And one of the challenges that we face uh, is how do you really try to understand the ecological context of much of this biomass? Uh, Okay, so let's go back to how would you really think about this environment. So very simply put, if you were diving deeply into the ocean on a vertical axis, uh, there is a euphoric zone, only 100 meters of it has light. So if you are a phytoplankton that cares about light, you better be in that 100 meters. And that's where the first paradox comes in, because most cells have cell density that's heavier than seawater. And so technically, uh, if you sink a known amount of distance, you should have to rise the known amount of distance for you to even survive and maintain in this ecosystem. Uh, if you look at pressure, every 10 meters, there is an atmosphere. Nutrients are distributed vertically. Temperature is distributed vertically. Effectively, and salinity, cell density, uh, uh, sea water density, every parameter that you care about is vertically stratified. So we have this beautiful context of an ecosystem that could be simulated in a column if we better understood uh, the behavior of these sets of organisms. Uh, the other aspect of this is it's not static. And this was found in World War II when the Navy essentially started looking at their sonar and they saw that every day the seafloor was rising. What that means is effectively life, which was that high density uh, biomass rises to the top in the night and sinks at the bottom. That's the signature that you can see. That's roughly around 600 meter of vertical flux per day. This is the world's largest biomass migration. And I haven't done the calculation myself, but I just found this estimate that I really find interesting, uh, which is the commute energy cost of all of this biomass per day is actually equivalent to the energy that we consume in the United States per day. Uh, so there must be a good reason all of this biomass is doing this up and down uh, every single day. So let's look at a very simple puzzle. So this is the first puzzle. There are lots of cells in the ocean that don't are not motile. So how would you go about surviving in an ocean in which the cytoplasmic density is 5 to 10% density of seawater? You apply Stokes flow uh, and you should sediment. And effectively, a diatom up there uh, would uh, uh, start sinking. If it crosses that 100 meter boundary, it effectively has no light. After 150, there is really no light. Uh, so you would end up in a situation where here are these sets of cells that have survived millions of years in the ocean. Uh, and we have not actually understood in terms of how these sets of systems even maintain their position in the ocean. One of the things to start thinking about is how do you study this problem? And I'm going to show you, because when we started asking these questions, we just decided to look and lots of surprises fell out. We don't understand uh, the, uh, the mechanism of how diatoms do this, but I'm about to show you a video that has surprised me for the last many years. The way we collected this video is by inventing a new technology which we call scale-free vertical tracking microscopy or for short gravity machine. So to give you the context, 
that's the uh, distance uh, in your words and representation uh, of the distances that we care about, that's 94 meters. A single cell might be traveling this distance up and down every single day, but the cell is only 10 to 100 microns, and I want to track it. I want to, I want to see what the cell does. Uh, and you can see there is a scale problem. I asked my department chair uh, to have access to a, a tall tower, and that was difficult to build a microscope that large. It won't be stable, but we came up with a trick to be able to understand and study these sets of creatures in this context. This is work that's published recently, uh, led by an incredible graduate student, uh, Deepak, who happens to be a postdoc at Berkeley now, and supported by another student, Hong Chuan Lee. Uh, let's take a look at the trick. We essentially made a, a treadmill for single cells. So what you're looking at is a tiny little ring. It's a glass ring that's that size, depending on organisms we're studying, we change these. Uh, and effectively, if a single cell is trying to swim up, we spin the wheel. So there are two locations at which we track the organism at a three o'clock and a nine o'clock. And because of the shear boundaries, if the organism is moving up, I move the wheel down. And if the organism is moving down, I move the wheel up. Uh, there is a certain sets of criteria and based on those sets of criteria, in the frame of reference of the lab, the cell doesn't go anywhere, but in its own frame of reference, it's actually fine. And what's really fun is then we can apply pressure, light, temperature, salinity in a virtual context to take any data from any part of the ocean, take the CTD values of uh, instruments that we dip in the ocean, look at the vertical stratification, map it to the machine and ask ourselves, how do cells make decisions? And so here is the surprise. Uh, it's been many years now, I'm still puzzled with this video. I'm going to show you what diatoms actually do. Uh, we're still trying to figure out how this works, but the purpose of this talk is to really show you how much fun it is. Uh, here is a single cell that's sinking, and within 100 milliseconds in a column of water, just decide, it's not a movie, the movie is still uh, is playing. It's not the movie that's jamming. It's a single cell that has supposedly no motile organelle. It's capable of fluctuating and changing its density. It's almost as if a stone was falling and you would saw it suspended. Uh, and you can watch the track up there and you will see right there when it reaches that track, the fluid is moving and uh, it starts sinking again. And you know we've known the existence of diatoms but we hadn't seen this behavior. And this is kind of what I mean by ecophysiology is if we are trying to understand the cellular context of how life operates in these perspectives, we really have to understand what these cells do. And ecologically, you can think about uh, the factor that if the cell really cares about suspending itself in these sets of water columns, a mechanism like this might be valuable. Now you might be thinking, how is this operating and working? Uh, so first of all, the measurements that you saw is 3% cell density fluctuation in a time period of 100 milliseconds. Uh, back of the envelope, if I was to just look at ion channels and choose the fastest ion channel that's known and just do some number games of being able to pump a certain amount of ion, I can barely make it for the surface of the cell if the cell happened to have completely covered with tons of these ion channels, you could potentially do this using ion channels. Uh, we're trying to do drug perturbation assays to prove that there is a particular ion channel that does this. And one thing that was a surprise that came to us very recently, somebody decided to patch clamp the technique that's used in neuroscience, a diatom. And lo and behold, they actually find that diatom spike. Now, nobody knows why would a diatom spike? Uh, and we believe this might be one of the answers. Uh, why the cell does this, why this 100 millisecond, why would you need to do cell density changes at such a sharp time scale? I have no idea. Uh, but this is the context that I wanted to think about in terms of, unless we ask these questions in an ecological perspective, if you study life under a cover slip, sometimes it'll represent that environment and you might miss on what it's really actually trying to do in an ecological context. Okay, so getting back to the toroid. So, we built this machine and we decided to take this machine on a trip. 
uh, out at sea. This is 100 kilometers off the coast of Hawaii. I just want to show you what it means and feels like to operate uh, and work at sea. Uh, so that's the gravity wheel. Uh, uh, this is Kilo Moana. It's one of the longest running NSF uh, measurement station. Uh, this was a fun moment for us. Uh, the storm is just right there. Uh, we had to really shut down, turn back. Uh, we suspended the trip because it was not safe. Uh, everything is bolted down to the ground. And I'll see, I mean, it really does feel like a normal lab otherwise, except you are just bouncing back and forth. And then you can go out and right there is where we collect our samples. Within a period of 15 or 20 minutes, we can bring a sample from 100 meters deep, bring it into the machine, dial in the sets of parameters that we care about, and essentially look at what it was doing. I wish we could throw the gravity machine underwater. We're not there yet, but that is one of the goals to really be able to understand this in the context of the environment. Uh, so that's just a picture of Kilo Moana. Uh, and uh, there are a couple of instruments that we've been building. Uh, several students have had the chance to go on several different research vessels, uh, all the way very recently to Antarctica. I don't have any data for it, but one of the things that I find uh, quite amazing is the, is the kind of focus that you have working on a vessel uh, because you are there a limited period of time. Every one of these trips costs $50,000 a day to just operate the vessel. So there is an immense amount of cost in working in an ecological uh, context. And we have to really figure out how to reduce that. Otherwise, these sets of studies will always be just anomalies and uh, very limited access. OK, so let's get back to the toroidal cell. Uh, this is Adam Larson, a postdoc in the lab. He was on the trip uh, with me and Deepak and Hong Chan. Uh, when we pulled out a cell from 75 meters deep, now, again, it is rare to find cells abundantly that deep, the cells that depend on light, because they are really playing with this boundary of 100, 150 meters. Uh, and it's an incredibly beautiful cell. And many of you might know this as uh, the bioluminescence that you actually see. I don't know how many of you have actually swum in the bioluminescence, but Pyrocystis noctiluca is one of several of these bioluminescent organisms. In the past, it's been documented to be a non-motile, deep living cell that still depends on light. And so you end up with the situation that a single cell has to have a capacity of traveling in every day 200 meters. Now, how would you go about doing something like that? Uh, and then, of course, if you or your next progeny is not capable of climbing the same distance that you think, you're eventually ruled out because that genome is out. So there is an incredible evolutionary pressure to rise up as much as you fall. And this is when came the surprise. Uh, we pulled out certain sets of cells out in the ocean. And this is a little bit choppy. I don't know. I think it's Zoom probably. I'll just drag it. Uh, anyway, this cell is sinking. Uh, not too exciting. We pull out another cell, and the cell is rising. Uh, morphologically, we look at many of these sets of cells uh, at the same time we can find cell populations that will be doing different sets of things. And we got really puzzled as thinking about what might be going on. And we started to bring the cell, uh, bring it to the lab. And here is the surprise. So I'm just gonna let this play. You're watching a single cell. And within a period of around 10 minutes, it massively expands six folds in volume. Now, if none of you do cell division or cell biology, this should really be puzzling because the volume of the cell has just massively exploded in a very short period of time. So first of all, you can't synthesize proteins in this much amount of time. Uh, also, this is a really bad idea for a cell uh, because you have your, all the enzymatic chemistry that you know works at a given concentration. And if you were to dilute it so massively, you would end up having none of the biochemistry would work at the same kinetics. Uh, so we look at that same expansion event and that is exactly when the cells are turning around. And this has been noted a little bit in the past literature that the deepest cells they find, the vegetative cells are rising and then when it's time to divide, they go down, a division happens, but now the cells are turning around and the cell expansion is associated with a density change. 
Uh, what's really going on is essentially it's taking in seawater and it's effectively diluting and changing its density to be able to rise like a balloon. But the puzzle still remains that if you were to take that much seawater, you cannot really actually perform like a cell. And this is where the toroid comes in. So this is the morphology of the cell. Uh, it's not a one genus torus, it's a N genus torus, I can't even count. What you're looking at is the nucleus at the bottom and the entire cytoplasm is completely reticulated. And it's wrapped around a vacuole, which is the vacuole that's going to expand. So all of that expansion and dilution really only happened in a vacuole. And I'll let this play because I love these videos in terms of just thinking about, you know, talk about topology of a cell. It's an incredible network of a cell. Uh, and of course, one of the things that you can do is you might ask, how does this cell divide? That's the expansion event. And if, if you think about the 1D versus 3D, there is strain on these cytoplasmic threads, but there is no dilution. And you can still survive topologically if you build a cell in this manner to be able to have uh, this kind of an expansion. Uh, one of the things is we can do TEM on this and really confirm effectively that there is no volume change in the cytoplasm when the cell expands. It's really a, a unique architecture. It's an architectural problem that the cell is trying to solve. Uh, and at that same time, it is able to, these are, you can see essentially plastids packed in into these sets of tubules that are being transported. One of the other things we don't understand about the cell is in the day and night cycles, it will shift and shuttle all of these plastids to be on the surface and they will all come back in and then get transported back again. So there's a lot of transport that's going on in this. Uh, if this was not sufficient, this cell has another surprise, uh, which was recently uh, discovered by another group. Not only is the cell toroidal, even the nucleus is toroidal. Uh, now that is quite baffling because we don't really understand how could you separate all your nuclei if you're... So the nuclei has what is called a nuclear net membrane with these giant sets of microtubules piercing through what is called a nuclear net through the nuclear membrane. And that architecture is still preserved. But somehow the cell is still capable of consistently separating out 40 to 80 sets of these chromosomes. Dinoflagellates from a nuclear context themselves are bizarre because their nucleus and chromosomes are liquid crystals. Uh, so they don't pack the same way that you might think about histones associated with traditional cells. Uh, this was a real surprise in the context of, I was not expected or thinking about this as a topological challenge. But again, this puzzle remains open currently in terms of thinking about how would a cell like this actually divide? No live cell imaging has been done in this context to really be able to map and measure. And we're trying to find uh, ways to really do high resolution imaging. And of course, this is not without challenges because there are no tools, there are no labels, there are no membranes. Uh, live cell imaging and these sets of things become, uh, become difficult. One thing that we find that the cells that we bring from the field to the lab, we can culture them. They don't go that big and they never go up. They never go up in the lab. They, they slow down, they have fluctuations, but within a generation or two, the kinds of environments that we are creating in the lab, which is abundant nutrients, abundant uh, algae, con uh, Effectively, we can't get them to replicate exactly the behavior that they might do in a, in a field setting. Uh, okay, so what about motile things? I'm gonna now go a little bit faster because I wanna show you guys just the incredible beauty of organisms that are associated in this perspective. And the range that we're interested in, we're not interested in the bacteria and the viruses in the ocean because they are bound to the laws of physics in some sense because rotational diffusion is such that they, their orientation gets scrambled very quickly. And so in the end, uh, no matter how much behavior you have, you really cannot have these long migrations. I'm not gonna be talking about the whales and the fish as well, because they are incredible at behavior and no matter the physics, a whale can dive kilometers in a single dive and come back. We actually still don't understand, for example, uh, many of these mammals, how deep they go and why they go that deep. It's, it's known that they go deep, but it's not really clear why they go that deep. I mean, some of it is related to food, but it's not so clear. But we're going to be in this Goldilocks zone 
where your behavioral velocity is roughly the same order of magnitude of the velocities that are seen in the ocean. And now an important thing, if some of you dive, you might know this, that when you dive beyond the first 10, 15 meters, which is called the mix layer, uh, how many of you dive? Anybody? No divers. Okay. Uh, this is very particular to diving, but if you're diving and you see a fish poop, uh, the fish passes by, but the poop stays there. That's because the vertical velocities and the velocities as you go further down in the ocean, uh, you know, of course, the ocean is very chaotic and turbulent in the first few sets of tens of meters, but beyond that, those velocities are only centimeters per second. So it's very low velocities afterwards, and this is why this type of a behavioral context matters, that a single cell can still exhibit behavior that will map to its own location. Okay, so here's the next puzzle, is you start looking at motile organisms, and there is just an astounding variety of shapes and forms. So many of you who are inspired by growth and form and thinking about uh, function associated with shapes, uh, here is a puzzle. There is an organism out there. These are all invertebrate larvae. Uh, many of these organisms might be uh, known to you, for example, the oyster or the sea cucumber and the sand dollar. But these are the larval stages. What you don't see, these are free floating larvae that swim around. And I love, for example, right there is what I call the crown jewel. Uh, I don't know if you can see something that literally looks like a crown. These are what are called ciliary bands. All of these shapes are based on a band of active cilia that is shaped around a circle. So let's just go back and think about how do these motile organisms move? Sometimes you can have cilia at a point. Sometimes you can have, that's 1D or 0D. 1D is what I'm calling a ciliary band. But imagine a tennis ball and paint a line across it. That line is your ciliary band. So effectively, it's this 1D actuator that's shaped in these intricate, beautiful ways. Of course, you go from 1D to 2D and then 2D to a closed surface. Uh, but the puzzle is, why would an organism shape this actuator in this manner? Uh, so this is, uh, for example, Pateria miniata, uh, bat stars that you can find all across the coast. Uh, and this is with uh, work with graduate student uh, William Gilpin, who now has his own lab in Texas and supported by Vivek Prakash, another postdoc who has his lab in Miami. Uh, and now if you think about these sets of little larvae back in the lab, uh, they are swimmers. But the surprise comes in when we literally watch them in the gravity machine. So I'm just going to play this video. And... Okay, so what you're looking at, there are three views of this data set. The organism is climbing. The blue trace is the z-axis, and the trace on the right is its behavioral trajectory. You see it's climbing. It knows up versus down very clearly, and suddenly something really surprising is about to happen uh, right there. It took a little dive, and uh, these videos are a little bit jittery. Uh, and then it's going to start climbing again. It figured out the orientation, and every hundred or so seconds, like a clockwork, the organism does this behavioral transition. So it's climbing again. You're about to see that same behavior play out again. It's going to what is called a ciliary reversal. I'm going to now play this in real time. It reverses its cilia. For a second, it's going to shut down. It sinks. Now it moves its band. This is actually a feeding event. Uh, and you will see for a second, when we visualize this, the flow field around this structure. Uh, so now I've turned on because we are doing volumetric imaging in this data set. We can actually see the three-dimensional flow field around it. It's generating these little vortices. And these vortices are turned on and off at a given point of time. And it's using it to essentially position itself for a feeding event. And once that is over, it's going to turn around. So many of you who think about systems neuroscience, here is the moment in the life of this larva when the nervous system is incredibly simple. It's based around the band. There are a few other spots. There are a few sensory cells. And it's capable of essentially doing these sets of complex turns. But it's very repetitive in its behavior. And then again, once the kink passes by, it'll turn around and switch. 
Uh, so let's just watch that now in the lab. And this is what it looks like if I was to hold the larva and you were in the frame of reference of the larva. One of the things that I have done here is I'm actually literally holding the larva. So there are certain sets of artifacts that appear. For example, the large scale circulations that you see would not be true. That's coming from the boundary conditions. But all of these turning vortices on and off are literally coming from now defects in the ciliary band. There are locations, anatomic locations at the points of the ciliary band that are turning on and off and giving rise to a little vortex. Now, why would an organism care about pumping all this energy in these vortices while it could just climb? So if you think about momentum transfer, you should just ideally pump all of that. If you push the fluid down, you would go up. The more vortices you generate, the less efficient you are in swimming up. Uh, and the reason for that is actually quite simple. Let me just skip this. That's the point of the defect. You can see the cilia at that point are beating all the way to the right and all the way to the left. And that leads to this ejected particles. And this is how they're tasting their food because these ciliary bands are essentially used for feeding. Uh, we call these tangle and splay defects. Uh, they can turn on. And essentially there is some evidence that the location of the neuron processes that are underlying these sets of cells, there are anatomical locations where a given sets of neurons that are turning on versus a given set of neurons on the other side that are actually anatomically different. So let's just look at this from a context of thinking about a very classic Blake solution. You can write this down and measure essentially the capture efficiency and swimming efficiency. And I'm just gonna show you this as a plot. So what you're looking at now, imagine those little red lines were particles that you're trying to capture. The more number of vortices you generate, the higher probabilities there are that you will actually sample those sets of particles that were further away from you. So it's almost like a, a gear stick in your car. You can have really highly efficient swimming or you can have really highly efficient feeding. You can't have both. And the organism figures out how to do both by turning one on and off. So it's effectively transitioning rather than thinking about a design where you would get stuck because the environments are so much uh, variable, you would go for a certain period of time. And then because much of the food and there are lots of shear bands in the ocean, if you find a small set of a trajectory where there is food, you would turn on these feeding vortices and then go back again. So this is all of this data that I just showed you is essentially on this site. Uh, we post all our data as it comes along. Um, one of the big things we are trying to do is to build a large database of vertical migration uh, of organisms in the ocean. So this is that same Pateria miniata larva, but now climbing half a meter. And you can watch tons and tons of these movies on gravitymachine.org. I'm gonna see how much time I have left because I wanna leave at least 10, 15 minutes for questions. Uh, okay, what about the three-dimensional context? I call this the tennis ball problem. Uh, it's a little bit hard to think about uh, solving that analytically. What I gave you as a solution is a solution in two dimensions, but you can solve this computationally. We can insert the number of defects and we can really think about what are the optimal sets of design parameters for why these number of bands actually exist. And one of the beautiful aspects of this is to be able to connect that to the biology, which is an incredible biodiversity of shapes and form essentially exists. Uh, there are certain sets of larvae that also change the topology of these bands. So they will go from a single band. Uh, this is a lily worm. And in their developed stage, they will cut there will be a scission event. And instead of having a single band, they will cut and then have two bands. Uh, there are a couple of people that recently have built swimming, free swimming robots based on these sets of ideas. So that's super exciting. Uh, but more interesting has been the history of this field in the context of larval form. And if any of you like poetry, uh, this is my favorite, uh, very niche uh, poetry book, Larval Forms and Other Zoological Verses, uh, in which Walter Garstang really describes many of these behaviors in just incredible verses. Uh, and then much of this data is associated on the site that I showed you. Um, okay, since we have maybe 10-ish more minutes, I wanna show you guys probably just 
one more example. So let's dive in a little bit on what I said in an eluding manner of uh, can single cells think? So we're gonna switch topics just for a second. And then this will be just very fast. I just wanna really show you one movie to uh, give you a sense of just admiration that we sometimes have for these single cells. Uh, one of the topics that we've been really interested in is this notion of evolution of complexity prior to the nervous system. So there is around 50 million years or so of time when multicellularity started, but neurons were not there. And so if you have to think hard about how would these sets of soft bodied animals essentially perform complex behavioral tasks. And because of the fossil records, it's so biased towards uh, uh, objects that leave a fossil, soft-bodied animals have really, we have no idea whether there are many sets of phyla that existed. Uh, these are called trace fossils. Trace fossils are a trajectory of an animal that has been embedded, which is highly complex, but we have no idea what that animal looks like. Uh, we've been studying this in the context of certain sets of multicellular animals that are alive today that have no neurons. And I'll just show you one or two movies associated with this. But before that, it might be fun to just watch what can single cells do? What is the class of complexity? If you really think about the eukaryotic diversity and specifically sets of protists, there are at least 13 of the 16 phylas that have always been unicellular. So if they've always been unicellular, they've had enough time, what do they do in the most complex sets of behavior? I'm gonna show you one complex behavior. Uh, this is work in the lab with, uh, uh, that got started with the postdoc squad coil. And now two graduate students, both Deepak and Ellie. Uh, here is the cell. It's one of my favorite cells. I can watch it forever. Uh, it's elegant. It just, uh, it's 60 microns is the body, but you notice the neck uh, and it's searching for food if you haven't figured that out. Uh, and we'll just watch it for a second. Uh, you can see this long extension and then contraction. And you might ask yourself, is there a method to this madness? What is it trying to do? Could we get behind the scenes? And of course, this field is fraught with all kinds of sets of ideas. Early on, uh, there were sets of these ideas that people had found a neuromuscular organelle inside single cells. Uh, all of that turned out to be not true, but for 40 years or so in the field of protozoology, there was this idea that there might be this hidden organelle that is the central equivalent of a central nervous system of single cells. But if you ask yourself physical ideas, uh, you might uh, start thinking about something is clearly coordinating this activity. And I'm gonna show you why we believe that there is some coordination is when you do give it food, watch what happens right there. That poor cell, which is equally complex, uh, uh, is now being devoured alive. Uh, the neck is unfolding. If many of you work on cytoskeletal, think about this is all real time. All of this data that you're watching is real time. The morphology of the cell is dramatically changing to essentially take on. And then the moment it's done, and of course, I, you can already see the ciliary activity, which we'll just talk about briefly. Uh, and the cell is going to move on and start looking for another uh, prey. Uh, now, the question really is, how do you frame questions in this perspective? How do you really think about what can we do? Of course, this is not a model organism. I can't turn genes on and off, but it's real time. So mechanics must play a role. There is no time for protein expression. There's calcium signaling probably, uh, but there is a lot of just pure mechanics to think about. And this has led us to quite a lot in the lab think about what we call mechanical nervous system or mechanical logic. And again, I am biased to what I've done in the past, but I'm going to give you a certain sets of ideas that it's really possible. And to just give you the extreme nature of this, uh, Scott found this video, <laughs> caught the animal, and this is now in its native environment. It's very hard to even see. The organism is right here. And look at the neck. We're going to play this one more time. Uh, I don't know if you can see the neck. It's like a kite. The cell is somewhere here. Uh, yeah, it's too choppy. Uh, um, oh, right there. There's the catch. That's the cell around 40 to 60 microns. 
and it can extend all the way to 1500 microns. Where did the membrane come from? Where did the cytoplasm come from? Uh, and uh, what has been done in the lab, uh, this is work from Ellie, is if you notice carefully the cytoskeletal architecture, the organism has an incredible cytoskeletal architecture. It's a helix uh, that you can see, those are microtubules that govern. And much of the patterning and what we believe the logic of this behavior is encoded in the mechanics of this cytoskeleton. Uh, and we've been doing a lot of PEM, uh, mathematical modeling and absolutely observation. So this is another example of that architecture just for a second. Right there is in its contracted state and now that's in its extended state. Uh, and effectively the cytoskeleton can transform in real time from this one state to the other. Uh, and then I'm gonna leave you with just a hint of what might be going on uh, associated with, there's a lot of work that we can do to first show that the organism has no blind spots. In the context of search, if it was a random search, so we do all our experiments with zero information environment, we just keep the cell, there is no food, there is nothing else that we know, and it still searches, and we just plot its head position as a function of time. And what you can see is effectively, although it looks like a random search, it is really exploring. It has no blind spots uh, in the, and much of that search can just be done and explained with some of the very simple first, second, and third bending modes. And effectively, the, so this is what's happening in the hydrodynamic context is the fact that that's the cell. So now I've only turned on, the tip has cilia, that are turning on and off. And the analogy I want to leave you with, because I'm gonna run out of time here, is I don't know how many of you have played with a garden hose that's turned on. So we will just, so there is an idea in uh, when rockets were being invented, that rockets used to get unstable very quickly. Uh, this is called the analogy of non-conservative forces uh, in, uh, uh, or what is called follower force. Uh, Non-conservative in the sense that the tip cilia, when it's turning on and off, the direction of that force when it compresses in and out is dependent on your shape mode. So unlike a beam that you would put between two plates and bend back and forth, it would have very uh, similar behavior every single time because the orientation of the force that you push it on and off with is always the same. But if you now put the force at the tip itself and you have a bending mode of this beam, the force changes. So the boundary condition of force is part of the problem that you're trying to resolve. These are called follower force examples. And we can write this down and run a class of equations. And one of the beautiful things that we find is that we discovered a very, very simple chaotic system uh, which is at the heart of this random search. So what you're watching are these sets of filaments. I'm tuning activity and elasticity, only two parameters. I'm turning the tip on and off just as a function of time. And I just run this forward and we essentially find period doubling every classical analogy. And the, if you go back home tonight, turn the faucet of your garden hose on and wear a wetsuit if you want and have it to be very flexible because it has to be, or you can dangle it and you'll see very quickly if the velocity that's coming out of the jet is fast enough. Uh, it's called the garden hose problem. Feynman thought a little bit about it. Many people have thought about it, but essentially this tube that's shooting out fluid will become chaotic. And what I find the elegance of these classes of questions is just, of course, nature is bound to find these solutions and they are just sitting out there uh, and only purely by observing these sets of factors. And now, of course, uh, having the kinds of mathematical models, we can then go back to the data and then compare. Uh, I am out of time because I wanna leave some time for questions. I'm gonna end with, a, with this picture again of, is there value in all of us to be thinking about, should we think about biology as a subject to be enjoyed by everyone, not just in the act of, reading the news, but in the act of engaging. And just like recreational mathematics, wouldn't be recreational mathematics if you just read the answers. 
Uh, and I think, you know, much of our past work in the last 10 years uh, with both scopes have taught us that it's possible to engage with life at microscopic scale. Many of the sets of examples, Scott and I discovered lacry. Uh, of course, we'd been looking for it for a while in a pond right behind Facebook, just playing around with both scopes. And that changed our trajectory of really thinking about this. Uh, but I want to leave you with this picture because I think one of the things that we sometimes forget is uh, when you're trying to do science, the power of observation and just how important it is to share that power of observation, not just knowledge. Of course, we have created these institutions around us that are primarily thought of as the mecca of all this knowledge, but knowledge is distributed. Much of life around the planet is distributed. And unless we engage more people, uh, you know, none of this curiosity will ever be uh, be found and we would lose them much faster than we can actually find them. So I'm hoping that all of you take some time, whatever you do, try to engage somebody, turn whatever you do into a recreational puzzle and see whether you can explain what you do in a sentence or two uh, to anybody uh, and your neighbors. So thank you very much. I'll take some questions. Oh, let's turn the lights on. This is, oh, so much better. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea is to not replicate the ocean. The idea is to introduce complexity in layers. So start with one single parameter like pressure in a zero information environment. If there is information for, we don't even know whether cells can sense pressure. For example, we don't know the sensitivity. I mean, this would give a global GPS coordinate system to a cell if the cell could just measure pressure, but pressure is different from force because pressure is isotropic. Classically, if you were to think of a piezo ion channel or a tension in a membrane, that does not give you a readout of pressure. So the idea is to you know, both work in an ecological setting, but add layers of complexity as you go by. So the way we do pressure is uh, fairly simple. Uh, there is an enclosed chamber in that wheel itself that we have a pump associated with. So pressure is easy. Uh, what's harder is actually salinity, because we are trying to dynamically change chemicals in this wheel while the wheel by definition is closed, otherwise it doesn't work, because we are exploiting this hydrodynamic. If you turn the wheel, there is also a sharp limit. If something is moving too fast, and if you turn, you would introduce inertia, and then it's the Heisenberg principle, you have perturbed what you're trying to observe. So the way we deal with that is essentially ways of thinking about dilation membranes, that can introduce chemicals without introducing flows. Uh, but the goal is to not create the ocean on a tabletop, but to really ask if you were to layer by layer add complexity, what could we learn? Something we can do in this virtual context is crosswire. What if I took a cell that cared about light? We know all cells care about light, but when it was going down, which we are, it also senses gravity, of the 70 or so species that we have recorded in this machine, I am yet to find a cell that does not care or sense gravity. I mean, if you think about the evolution of life on the planet and just gravity has been fundamentally there, it's an information that's accessible. There are a few sets of examples of how gravity is sensed, but it's a big open question. We can cross wire in a virtual environment. So when the cell is going down, I could reduce the pressure or I could increase the light and ask you know, in a multimodal world, what would be the sets of priority? So it's, it's almost a, it's a playground, but the goal is to, we will never be able to replicate. It's about going back and forth. And that's why we actually take the machines to the ocean as well, because just the act, one generation time of bringing a cell from the ecosystem back into the lab, we can see behavioral changes. So.
any other yes <laughs> yeah that's really ellie's phd uh, one thing that we discovered first of all you can ask some very simple questions uh, you know, going from 60 microns to 1500 microns is a massive amount of microtubule. Is the microtube, where is it stored? Uh, it turns out uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, TMs and this is, story is still evolving, but it's all coiled in this neck. And the neck has something spectacular, which is, I don't know how many of you play with curve origami. Uh, and a fact that like the last 10 years, it's been a very exciting space that you can do origami with curved surfaces. And what we discovered is that the membrane is stored in these sets of folds around the helix as a curved origami. And the analogy that Ellie and I like to give is often a spooling analogy, that there's a lot of microtubules stored in a spool and only at this transition point from the body to the neck, because you don't want the nucleus and all the cell body to be shoveled out into the neck. So this organism does not stretch technically. It actually deploys a region of the membrane and the microtubule at a transition point. And what we are starting to find is that curvature plays a huge role. It's almost like a curvature clutch. Microtubule and membrane is passing through this shape. And this shape is really determining a transition point from one side to the other. And all of, uh, I used to, we are playing with an idea of making a mechanical version of this in the context of literally origami, because early on we started thinking about this and the numbers were not adding up until we started doing the TEM in terms of thinking about where is the microtubule stored? Where is the membrane stored? Currently what we believe is the microtubules go all the way from the bottom to the tip. And there is literally that long a microtubule. It's not a single microtubule, it's a bundle. And these sets of bundles form plates. And this is very common in, uh, in ciliates. The cortical microtubules have remarkable architectures. They're very well preserved. Uh, but the current uh, hypothesis is that all of this is packaged and it can be readily deployed and curled back in within hundreds of milliseconds, which is what it gets its strike. Because then it strikes, it has to be fast. And then at the tip, there are large cilia they generate the forces, but also all around the neck, there is distributed cilia. So whenever it's going out, it's actually also twisting with the chirality of the microtubule. Uh, we're trying to do some force spectroscopy on it to hold the ciliate on two sides, stretch it to really understand why uh, it only unfolds in this particular manner. And I think what we believe is the answer lies in this curved origami structure. Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, I have a whole talk with 50 slides uh, just on this, uh, and I'm not going to give that talk, but I do want to show you just one thing. Thank you for asking that. Uh, so uh, let me just jump to this for a second. Oh, my computer, 1%. Wow. Uh, And I don't have my charger. Oh, wait a second. I have it plugged. Of course, it's not turned on. Did I resolve that? Um, oh, wow, that was, that was close. Uh, in the lab, we study this idea of what we call Goldilocks complexity of... Yes, the question. The question was, can you make a model of a mechanical neuron, right? And again, this was the quest without knowing whether something like this would exist or not. The idea is that, I mean, again, computation is a loaded word. There can be many contexts to it. Behavior is essential. Behavior is essential to collection of cells, to single cells. And there is a massive record that's missing in this perspective of multicellular organisms. 
Uh, and we started asking, are there sets of animals that show complex behavior but have no neurons? Turns out, if you look at the tree of life, it's often enough not drawn, but there are two entire phylas that have no signatures of neurons, and we work on one of those. Uh, these are flat sheep. And uh, long story short, uh, what we've been able to discover is an analogy of what we are now calling ciliary flocking. I'm just going to play that for a second and then give you this neuroscience analogy. So first of all, this is a sheet of cells with literally one to 10 million cilia. Imagine the, having that many legs, how would you coordinate it? And you end up actually finding that these sets of structures, just like flocking birds are capable of, uh, so I don't know if you can notice the vortex right here. I'll just play this. I don't know why it's not playing. Uh, and then now the vortex is shifting up that way. Actually, yeah, it might not work. Uh, the idea is to be able to take these classes of existing systems, because of course, it's one thing to just build in abstract. Right, you have a very valid point. I could take a mechanical system and I could come up with hundreds of things that you could do, but did that actually happen or do are biological parts enough? And the analogy that I always like is we did this work, we identified an example of how mechanical, mechanically encoded behavior can exist in an existing animal. And then we broke our rules and we literally created a phylogeny tree, which is purely mathematical. And much of this is work with a fantastic graduate student, Matt Bull. Much of this is posted on archive. So if you really think about mechanical neurons, uh, take a look, we make many different analogies very directly to how mapping mechanics to how we understand currently the nervous system. But the analogy that I wanna give is what I mean by breaking all the rules is then we created a synthetic phylogenetic tree, which is purely just based on mathematical ideas and asked if you could just add one more mathematical principle or one more mechanical component, how much more could you do uh, behaviorally? And that's been really fascinating because it's teaching us something where we can find a solution and then we could go back and look whether we can find any evidence of that idea existing in a biological system. So it goes both ways. Oh, what we do is uh, we seed the fluid with just little beads, and then we do volumetric imaging. So many of you who have played with liquid uh, lenses, uh, we essentially do volumetric imaging. And so once you have that, you can do PIV and get the entire 3D flow field. Uh, it is really fun because sometimes without that flow field, you might realize you might see something and not truly appreciate what might be going on. Uh, for example, I don't know how many of you have thought about when you add sugar in your cup of coffee, what really happens to that piece of sugar as it's falling? It's an object that's shrinking, it's dissolving, uh, and it's changing. Uh, and it, I mean, we literally do that by just putting even non-living things. Sedimentation is a beautiful field. Such simple objects, like if you were to sediment two particles that are dead, you know, they, they circle around each other. It's almost like orbits in their own frame of reference. Uh, so there's beautiful phenomena that are physical that exist, but unless you observe them, uh, it's very hard to think about them in an intuitive manner. So I think we have a rule in gravity machine, any cell type, any uh, <laughs> new sets of particles we make. We've been using 3D printers recently uh, to make some fairly complex topological shapes and just dropping them. Uh, there are these new 3D printers that are out there that can make 100 micron particles. Uh, so there's a lot you, you can do just with very simple ideas, uh, even with the non-living uh, object itself as well. Yep. Yeah, I skipped that because we're still trying to figure that out. Uh, the way it pinches in a, oh, so the question is how an incredibly reticulated cell will actually divide. 
And I started with that question because topologically that's complicated. The ideas that we have for cytokinesis don't work because you would have to have thousands of cytokinetic rings. What we do see is that eventually when they are in their division phase, some of the reticulated network are drawn as well. But it's not so clear whether they are topologically different or whether just the plastids, which is what we can track, which is what we use as a proxy have been retracted. So there is, there's possibly new cytokinesis machinery hidden in systems like these, because otherwise I cannot explain how would you divide that. And there is no signal uh, that would be global in that context. And I think this is why I love these puzzles so much, uh, because uh, it pushes us to just think about a very simple idea that a lot of people have thought about, but with a new light. So I got nothing for you. Yeah, which is a great, that's a great thing for you to have. <laughs> Yes. Any last minute questions? Yeah. Yeah, I think again, going back to that, you can never replicate the environment in the lab in the ocean it's filled with bacteria and viruses um, we have been looking at zombie cells recently thinking about when you are infected uh, and you're not dead uh, would you have very different uh, behavioral cues so there's tons of information in your environment uh, one way to think about this is uh, creating chemotactic gradients uh, but of course, <laughs> the challenge is if you think about life in the ocean that's falling, bacteria are organized around dead particles that are called marine snow that are sedimenting. So if you are a copepod or an organism that's dead, everybody wants to eat you and you're falling. That's your carbon flux, that's sequestration technology. Either it's poop or a dead uh, organism. Uh, but around it are a uh, cloud of bacteria that are decomposing it. And this is what I meant by, we don't understand the biological pump with physical context, is that if the rate at which the bacteria would be able to decompose this falling body, because if they do decompose it, the carbon goes back up, it does not sink down. If you can cross this 500 meter boundary, you have locked the carbon for around a thousand years or so. But if you don't cross that boundary, because the bacteria would just metabolize it back again, and then they are in that water column, you don't actually sink. So many of these plumes and these sets of bacteria are generating cues, and there's chemotaxis associated with it. We've been trying to create chemotactic gradients, uh, but much of the data that I showed you was devoid of any of these other stable gradients, because we still don't understand, even at the base level, uh, what would they do without these sets of cues. So, I, I like complicated things, uh, but I like step-by-step. Step. So we're really in the early phase of being able to do these assays. <laughs>